It is good to be in God's house this morning. Amen? Amen. 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 Choir did a wonderful job today. Those songs, so you know what we're looking at this morning. The resurrection, Christ's resurrection, our resurrection, and His second coming. All were mentioned in this passage this morning. If you have your Bibles with this morning, open up to one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we'll start in verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we'll start in verse 1. Now, we won't cover the chapter this morning. On Easter, just a few months ago, on April the 9th, we, we cherry-picked, we went through the 15th chapter and cherry-picked out 10 or 12 verses as we went along about different things. This morning, we're going to go start verse by verse. We'll take us two or three Sundays to go through this. But I never get tired of preaching Christ's resurrection or your resurrection from the dead. Now we'll still go kind of quick. We'll probably cover out 29 or 30 verses this morning. But still, this is a, a whole letter written about problems. Wow. Everything in, after the first few verses and the last chapter, all about problems this church has. When we get to this chapter. And I'm glad they had this problem because it gives Paul the opportunity to write a long chapter. Let's see. 58 verses correcting the doctrine about the resurrection. They believed in Jesus' resurrection. That wasn't an issue. They, they, had, they had the gospel down good. This church had lots of problems, morally, spiritually, but they held true to the gospel. That's why Paul calls them brothers. But they had a problem like the church at Thessalonica did. Like a lot of Greek churches did. They didn't believe in Christian resurrection. That's why Paul writes this to the church at, at Thessalonica. And it's one of your favorite verses. You've, you've heard this so many times in your life. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, those that are dead, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Because of their Greek background, they just could not think about that these bodies would raise from the dead. So Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica, I don't want you to be ignorant. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and they did, even so, them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, not Paul talking, but God, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, we shall not go in front of them, perceive them. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words and that we have throughout the centuries. Comfort to know that death is not the end for those that know Christ as Savior. There's a glorious resurrection coming. Well, let's get on these verses here. The main thought this morning is this. Maybe the most important question I've ever asked you. Have you experienced a resurrection of Jesus Christ the Messiah for yourself. Do you know him as a risen king? Do you know him? Verses 1 through 4, and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Moreover, brethren, again, they're brothers, I declare unto you, what is it declare? The gospel which you also received. I preached it, you believed it. Not only did you believe it, wherein you stand in it by which also you're saved by it. If you keep the, in memory what I've preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. I wish the King James had not translated that word if because it's not if at all. It can be translated if, but it's a first class con, uh, conditional in the Greek. It says since. Since you are saved. I love that word saved, don't you? When I ask people, are you saved? Sometimes, Brother Danny, they look at me like I'm from another planet. Well, 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 I go to church. I, I, I hope someday. No, 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 no. Are you saved? Yeah. 
I'm not talking about being safe. I'm are you saved by the blood of Jesus? If you are, since you keep it in memory what I preach to you, unless you think you believed in vain, something silly, if you really believe this, and I do, for I declare unto you that first of all, in the Greek, of first importance, and your translation may say that, I, don't, I didn't check any translations for that verse. First importance, that which I also received, I didn't make this up, God gave it to me, how that Christ died for our sins. Yes, He did. He satisfied the atonement of God. We needed to be made at one with God. The only way we can be at one with God is someone pay our price. And He satisfied the will and the wrath of God. God was not displeased with Jesus as He hung on the cross, as some preacher, preachers preach. He was never more satisfied with Him. That's where He paid the price for our sins. Felt the, felt the weight of all of our filth. He who knew no sin, it says later on to the Corinthians, became sin for us. Wow. Wow. How that Christ died for our sins. According to the Scriptures. Old Testament taught us that. And that He was buried. He was buried, as that song said, carrying our sins all away. That He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. The resurrection was no afterthought. The resurrection is part of the plan of Almighty God. One of the big, big seven, you know, you know, we talk about them all the time, the cardinal, the foundational doctrines of the church. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, conceived in Mary by the Holy Ghost, by the Holy Spirit, that he lived a sinless life, that he died in your place on Calvary, that they put him in the grave according to the Scriptures, that he rose again. That he went away into heaven. And number seven, someday he's coming back. He may be today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Could be today he's coming back to get us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. Pray, Lord God, that your hand would be upon us as we look at some of these verses this morning. Oh, God, I'm not trying to prove the resurrection to this crowd. Lord God, rejoicing in the resurrection. But if there's any that don't know Christ as Savior, that today would be that day for them. That they would let the resurrected Lord be their Lord. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you right now, Lord God, for what we're about to receive from your hand. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, so Paul starts out, basically the same outline that we used. The paragraph didn't change, but we're going to go verse by verse that we use for Easter, but evidence of the resurrection. Evidence of the resurrection. Well, the first one I just read to you, verses 1 through 4. The Scripture, the Word of God is proof number one. Brethren, you put your faith in Christ, believe the Gospel. Let me stop right there in verse 1 for a second. Too many churches today <clears throat> do not preach the Gospel. Come to our church, and keep all these rules. Act right. Do right. Keep all the rules. Someday you might get into heaven. Well, that's not very good news, is it? <laughs> Remember the word gospel, just, it's just good news. Evangelio, the good news. Some churches say, come to our church. We'll love you. We'll love you so much. We'll just love on you so much. And, and you stay with us and you'll find yourself. What a reward. I don't want to find myself. I don't know what I am. <laughs> I don't want to find myself. That's not much of a goal. I want to find Jesus, don't you? <laughs> I don't want to find Him in the dark nights when my heart is hurting. I want to find Jesus on the bright days when I want to worship. I want to find Jesus every day of my life. Not, not myself. No, the gospel. Jesus Christ died in your place. He buried, but death could not hold Him. Hallelujah. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they believed it. They believed this. Since you have believed this. Verse 2. Since you have believed this. It's not in vain. You believe this because the Bible told you this. I preached it. You believed it. Paul says. That's still how it is today. You'll share the gospel with someone. You become the preacher. You share the gospel with someone. They repent of their sins. That's still the same path. That's how everybody gets in the family. 
You're not, you're not born into it by your natural birth, but you're born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Second evidence, eyewitnesses. Look at these eyewitnesses. Verses 5, uh, I guess all the way through maybe about verse 8, but these eyewitnesses steal the evidence now. And that he was seen of Cephas. That's what Paul always calls Peter out of respect. He always calls him the rock. Cephas, the rock of God. And he was seen. Seen. Peter saw it. Peter, the one that had denied him. Three times he denied him. But on resurrection day, Peter saw him. God had a, Jesus had a private, God the Son had a private meeting with Jesus. I mean with Peter. Peter was strength. The same one that denied him now, Sister Ann, is willing to die for him. <laughs> oh, he doesn't mind now. He'll preach the gospel. They beat him. You read through the book of Acts. <laughs> the people forsake him. <laughs> they make fun of him. <laughs> he just keeps preaching the word of God. Hallelujah. Then at the twelve, now when you say, well, I thought, I thought that Judas had already, yeah, Judas had already committed suicide. And we know that first time that he comes, Thomas is not there. When it says the 12, that's just a way of saying the group, the, the 18, you know, like you might say, uh, uh, I met with the, uh, the all-stars. Maybe one of them was missing, but it's the all-stars. So it's just the all-star group. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. And then Paul says the most amazing thing because 1 Corinthians were written very early in the church. Of whom? The greater part, Paul said, I talked to them. I wasn't a believer for many years, but I've talked to these people. Most of them still remain until this present day. But some are falling asleep. Some of them have passed since then. After that, he was seen of James. Not James the less or James the brother of John. James his brother. He, could you... All the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ denied him. Throughout his life, time after time, you read, read in the Gospels. But after this, we read that even on the day of Pentecost, only shortly, weeks after Christ had, had died and risen from the dead, we see that all of his brethren are saved. There are the brothers of our Lord, it says, are in the upper room. Hallelujah. Implying not just his brothers, but his sisters, his family, they're believers. But James, the oldest brother, next to Jesus, just younger than Jesus. Leader of the family now, since Jesus is gone, Joseph has long been passed. Jesus, as he hung on the cross, had turned over John, the apostle, and turned over Mary to John. Remember, behold your mother, John, you take care of her. Well, now that John can give her back to James. James is a believer. James dropped that beautiful book about poor people, doesn't he? If a poor man comes in your congregation, what do you think? That, that Mary and Joseph, we start reading four brothers, and it says sisters, so at least two, so maybe more. And, and, and Jesus, that's seven, at least, children of Joseph and Mary. And James has said, what do you do when a poor man comes in your congregation? I love to read the book of James. It's like just raking you over the coast saying, let's have faith. You want to have faith? Show me your faith without works and it'll be dead. I'll show you my faith by my works, James says. Hallelujah. Then seen of all the apostles. At last, he was seen of me also. Paul says, I saw him. To be an apostle, you had to physically see Jesus alive. Not in a vision. Paul says, I was in Galatia, the backside of the desert. There for months and months and months and Christ met with him, taught him the gospel, caused him, said, you'll be, the, you'll be the preacher to the Gentiles. You'll stand before kings. You'll be beaten for me. All these things. And Paul knows exactly what he's getting into. But when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, <laughs> that's not the last time he met him. I, I was seen. That's one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles. That I am not fit, not meet to be called an apostle. In my own opinion, but God called me. Because why I persecuted the church of God. I had Christians killed. We read the testimony of how he was there when they, when they stoned Stephen to death. But that's not all. When he got the day he got saved, he was entering into Damascus. He's right at the, the Damascus Grove with a group with him. So there's many men with him. And he sees the great light and he falls to the ground. 
And the rest of them hear a noise that said, a thundering, but he heard a voice. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting, he didn't say the church, why are you persecuting me? God takes it personal when people persecute his people. And at that time, Saul was not saved until that second. And then, you know, the next words come out of his mouth? Lord, uh, who are you? Whoever you are, you're my new Lord. Uh, I love that. Well, you go on down to Damascus. There'll be a man named Ananias come and share the gospel with you. At that time, Jesus blinded him physically. That's a sign of his spiritual blindness. When Ananias preached the gospel to him and he was baptized, the scales fell from his eyes. He could see and he followed God. Hallelujah. For by the grace of God, I am what I am. He's honest. He's not in this. is not pride talking. His grace was bestowed upon me. It was not in vain. I believe the grace of God. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Say, is he bragging? No, he's just saying there's no bragging impulse. It's all grace. All of the work I do is by the grace of God. Uh, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. I was an apostle born out of season. But God put me to work. And he gave his life to the word, didn't he? We read the, the second, first half of the book of Acts is basically about Peter and his work and spreading the gospel even to the filthy Gentiles. But then Paul, the rest that goes over, starts talking about Paul giving his life for the Lord Jesus Christ. All that he did ends with him in prison, but we know that he gets out and preaches even more. I labored more abundantly than they all. Let me ask you a question. Do you think he's saying that other apostles are lazy people? No, no, by the way, I just help you out. He didn't say, well, now that's all pretty good, but you know that is, he just wasn't a very good worker. And little James, I didn't think much. No, that's not what he's saying at all, guys. He's saying, God anointed these men. In fact, you read church history, you'll see that one by one, they all gave their life for Jesus until, until John was left, the old apostle in his 90s. They put him in the bullying oil and he would not fry. <laughs> I mean, said so he wasn't a friar. <laughs> he just kept preaching the gospel. They put him on a prison island and he writes more of the, more of the word of God, the last book of the Bible. No, he's not saying they're not good men. He's just saying God's anointed me by God's grace. I've given my heart to this. That's a good testimony. We're saved by grace. <laughs> Let's go back to, to James again. James said, but you know, we've got to show our work. And the last witness is you. Therefore, whether it were I or they. So we preached. Here you are. So you believed. <laughs> and I tell you what, I'm still, I'm not an eyewitness of Jesus, but I'm a witness, brother Tony, in my heart. <laughs> he came into my heart and saved my filthy soul from sin. Made me brand new. And you're a witness. <laughs> in fact, that's what we're called to be. We're, it says, go out and preach the gospel to all the world. We are the witnesses of Jesus Christ. So now, so far, no problems with the Corinthian church, right? You're just tell them about Jesus, resurrection. Next section here. We're hopeless, though. Verse 12 through 19. If there's no resurrection, what would happen if there's no resurrection of dead bodies? That's what this whole paragraph's about, verse 12 through 19. Here's what would happen. And Paul gives a long list. I just chose five of them out, okay? It's up on your outline there. Things that would happen. If there was no resurrection of the dead. Verse 12. Now we preached. Now if we preached that he rose. And he did. From the dead. How say some of you. There is no resurrection of the dead. Here's the problem. You believe that Jesus rose from the dead. But now you're saying. That Christians won't rise from the dead. Well, that's a big problem. Here's the results of what happened if that's true. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, number one, Christ is still dead. Then is Christ not risen? If, if, if your Greek teaching is that physical bodies cannot raise from the dead because they're made out of clay, 
then Jesus Christ Himself has a body and He physically rose from the dead. So if there's no resurrection, Christ is still dead. It's not my argument. It's Paul. I'm not smart enough to make these arguments. If Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain. Your faith is also vain. If Christ is not risen from the dead, you're still bound for hell. Verse 14. Your, our preaching is vain. It's empty. Your faith is you might as well be a Buddhist. You might as well be a Muslim. You might as well join some cult or something. Just feel good about yourself. Find yourself if that's what you want to do. If Christ didn't raise from the dead, then he repeats it. No, no, no. First he said, then all the apostles, including me, were all liars. Yea, we are found false witnesses of God because we've testified that God raised up Christ whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not, then all the apostles are not good men. You know, people say, because I've actually, there are pastors standing in pulpits today. One of them wrote a book not long ago. They said, Jesus did not rise from the dead. The denomination is so weak. Methodist denomination, they wouldn't even throw him out of the denomination. When you deny that Jesus rose from the dead, you ain't a preacher, you're a piece of filth. You should not have a church to stand behind the pulpit. Amen. He said this. Jesus did raise from the dead. But don't think the apostles were mean people. They're just trying to help people feel good about yourself. No. If the apostles are liars, Calvin, they're despicable human beings. You better not feel good about yourself if Jesus is dead. You better not feel good about yourself because you joined some church and you're nice to people. That's no gospel at all. No, Paul says we are liars because we are false witnesses of God because we testified about the one we met that he raised up Christ who be raised not up if, if the dead don't raise, if, there be, if the dead rise not. Then he repeats two of them. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. That's what he already said up in verse 13. If Christ be not raised, it's not like verse 14 again, your faith is in vain. In case you missed it the first time, he, he clarified it for you this time. You're still in your sins. You have no hope at all. You're completely and totally hopeless. Next one. Then they which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Dead believers are lost forever. Perished. The Greek word means to be loosed from existence. To be loosed from existence. To be spread out as a, as, as a, as a piece of paper burned out in, out in the sun. It just goes up into the air. If, if, if the dead don't rise, dead believers are hopeless. And not only that, here's one you know by heart. If in this life only we have hope, in Christ we are of all men most miserable. We're completely pitiful. Your translation may say pitiful. Both translations are good. Miserable, pitiful, to be pitied. To be pitied. We cannot be delivered. Our forgiveness, our eternal life. There's no hope. If there's no resurrection from the dead. But he doesn't leave them there, does he? Let's look at the next part. So we start out good, verses 1 through 11. Now he gets to the problem. That if, if there's no resurrection, we're still in our sins. We're of all men most miserable. We're pitiful is what we are. Then he comes to this. There is a guarantee, you know. There's a guarantee of your resurrection. <clears throat> but now, if there's a bigger but in the Bible, I don't know where it's at. <laughs> but now, but now, is Christ risen from the dead? <laughs> yes, he is. Not just in the past, but he's alive today. Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He became the first fruits of those that slept. Now, let me tell you about that word first fruits. I love that. The Greeks would say, use it, so they're going to remember the Corinthian church has some Greeks in, some Gentiles in, some Jews in it. The Greeks would use this exact same, the, the Jews would use it one way, the Greeks would use it another. So Paul's using it both ways. It's a parka. He is the aparka. To the Greek culture, that is what would happen in any business. When you pay to your bill, <coughs> you would get a receipt. 
Guess what? We still do that today. They'll give you receipts saying, yeah, you paid your bill. Or you got your canceled check. Jesus Christ, church, His resurrection is a canceled check. He, he is the receipt that the bill has been paid in full. He died on the cross of Calvary, paid for all of your sins. It was completed on Calvary. But buried according to the scripture and the proof to the whole wide. Let me ask you a question. I'm going to be honest. I want you to answer me if you want to. What good would a dead Savior be to the church? Not good at all. I couldn't find any other answer but four letters. None. What good is a dead Savior to the church? None. You say, we pay for our sins on Calvary. Yes, but how could you know that for sure? Because they put him in the grave. And the grave could not hold him. Amen. He got up out of the grave. As a proof. In fact, Matthew says that when he rose that day, many of the saints of God who were laying around him got up and went into Jerusalem. It appears with resurrected bodies, never to die again. They, they evidently, he was the first fruit. See, he was the first. Let's talk about the Jewish word, meaning of the word. First fruits. Is a day that first fruits. Listen this day and see if this don't get you excited. Go to the Old Testament, to the book of Leviticus. Here's when first fruits would be celebrated. Every year started the great feast of first fruits that lasted for weeks, all the way up to Pentecost. Okay? Then you'd have the feast of Pentecost. Uh, first fruits happened the first day of the week, Sunday, after the first Sabbath, after the Passover. Because Passover. We think about it being on Friday because that's when Christ died, but it could have been on a Thursday or Wednesday. Passover could be on a on a Monday. And if you watch the Jewish calendar year by year, you see it's on different days of the week. But first fruits was always the day after, the first Sabbath day. It could be three days later, five days later, whatever, which would be Saturday. The first first Sabbath day after, the next day after that is always first fruits. What day did Jesus raise from the dead? <laughs> First day of the week. After the first Sabbath day of the Passover. So as the Jewish priest will be taking that grain of stock as they did every single year except for the time they were in Babylonian captivity. He would stand before the altar of God. At the breaking of day someone would read Psalm 22. And he would take this sheep and he would wave it. It was a first fruit offering. The first fruit, the aparka of what was coming. That praise God, Moses said, do this to praise God, that God is sending a bountiful harvest. As that priest was waving that stock, the women were walking to the tomb. And when they get there, what do they find? The first, the first fruits had done God up out of the grave, hallelujah. And the stone was rolled away not to let him out because he had a glorified body. But the let the apostles and the women look in and see that there is an empty tomb in Jerusalem. Praise his holy name. He is the first fruits. The first fruits of resurrection morning. Resurrection morning. He raised from the dead. No blood sacrifice. One of the few Jewish sacrifices. No blood sacrifice that morning. That would be the daily sacrifice later that time it would be just the first fruits offered to God. Massive Jewish celebration kicked off. That's the day that God began the celebration that the church was alive. And you people say the church was born on Pentecost, but we know it was born on the cross uh, when he died for our sins. He resurrected from the dead on the first Sunday after his crucifixion. Hallelujah. Jesus the Redeemer. So, Christ is the first fruits. He's the receipt. He's, everything is done. Not a down payment. It's the receipt that all is paid in full. The last thing he says on the cross before he gives up the ghost, he says, it is finished. Yes, it is. Hallelujah. All right, next. Everything will be in order. For since by man death came, by man, Jesus, came the resurrection from the dead. Let me go back to that thought again. Jesus is the first person to have a resurrected body. 
You say, well, the other people raised. What about the uh, the widow's son that that that, that Elijah raised? Elijah raised him. What about the uh, the one that Elisha raised? And what about the dead bones that was thrown into Elijah's tomb? And what about all of them that Jesus has raised from that? They were all raised to die again. They were raised with the same mortal bodies. But Jesus is the first fruits. And when he got up out of the grave, I, I wish Matthew told us more. He said, many of the saints are rose with him. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know how long God let them stay on the earth. But they were the first fruits. But, and listen, it's still the first fruits. You gotta understand, he was the first fruits, and all of us after wait, you say, I don't want you to understand. What is it? Pause and tell you. For as in Adam all died, all people are born in sin, no matter what other churches teach. You are born with a sin nature. Even so in Christ shall all be made alive. It doesn't mean every human being, all that will believe. He paid the price for everybody. Everybody. Can believe. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But every man in his own order, there's an order to this. Christ the first fruits. First with the resurrected body that will never die again. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. There it is again, one of the big saying, but at his coming. He's coming. And when Christ comes, the church of Jesus Christ will be raised from the dead. You don't know how many days, every day actually, I sit on my porch in the morning, I do my Bible reading. I did it again this morning. I sit there and I do my Bible reading and I can look from my porch. I had them cut down the brush and boys. <laughs> cut down the brush so I can see mom and dad and Connie's grave. I can't really see Connie's. It's a little box there where she was cremated. I see mom and dad's grave markers. The flowers on top of it. And every morning, Ray, I think, get up out of that grave, daddy. <laughs> Come on, Connie Sue, Mommy. Pop up out of that grave and we'll go with you. Hallelujah. It can happen, guys. Jesus is coming. And the first fruits is Him. Then all of us in order will go with Him. Oh, hallelujah. Verse 24. I know I won't do justice to this, but I'm going to go on. That Jesus Christ was King of all. Hallelujah. All the enemies are put down. The last one will be death. I, no, no, no commentary I had come close to doing justice in this passage of Scripture. But I'll do my little part. Then, we we're all raised from the dead. Now, not all the world. All believers. That is coming. Then cometh the end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. Even to the Father. When he shall have put all... Put down all rule and all authority and power. You see, after we go to be with him for the marriage supper of the Lamb, we're going to come back for his second coming. So he won't touch down the earth when he raptures the church. He said, I just read it to you. He said, he's going to come in the clouds, the trump of God will sound, the dead in Christ shall rise. First we'll go up with them. First Thessalonians. But listen to this right here. But then we'll come back to this old earth. I can't wait when I get back. I hope we don't. I hope the Lord doesn't tarry his coming. But if we get back from Alaska, the Lord's willing, we'll jump back into this passage in verse 29. And that same, and that Wednesday, as soon as we get back, I'll be able to teach Psalm 23 and Psalm 24. Lift up your head, O ye everlasting gates. The King of glory shall come. Who is this King of glory? The Lord mighty in armies. <laughs> Talking about his second coming, Psalm 24. Hallelujah. All right, so. Then at the end, then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the, the kingdom of God, even the Father, when all shall have put down. If you're worried about politics and pot potentates, and you're worried about the world, I want you to know it's all going to be put under one ruler, and his name is Jesus. Amen. And he will set up his kingdom in Jerusalem. So I don't believe all that. Well, you need to read the book of Revelation, especially chapter 19. It says that we that are believers shall live and reign with him for that thousand years. There'll be other human beings being born on it. Isaiah says, if a man died in a hundred years old, it'd be like a stillbirth. People, they will have a glorified bodies, but other people, they'll live and live. Can you imagine a, a man and woman celebrating their 817th wedding anniversary? <laughs> have the family over. That's a big crowd. We've got 9,222 great, 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 great grandchildren. We got, I mean, can you just imagine what a time it'll be? And you'll be here. 
And it says children will play in the streets of Jerusalem. Not pray. They'll just, kids will still play. The millennial kingdom, the house going to be spiritual. Love. Kids will be playing and jumping up and down. And Wow, what a time. That ain't even eternity. That's just the kingdom. For he must reign. Of necessity, he must reign till he's put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. I thought this morning, as we took the prayer request for Sunday school, the people started mentioning this family that lost a loved one, this family lost a loved one. And I'm thinking, I sat there saying to myself, I hate death. Death is not my friend. Death is the enemy. But you know what? That enemy will be put down. When we get when we get to the end of this chapter, you'll see how grave where is thy victory? Death, where do you have any sting on me? Jesus Christ is a victory. Hallelujah. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, we get to the Psalms here again. It is manifested that he is accepted, which he did put all things under him. In other words, God is going to put all things under the feet of Jesus. But then the kingdom comes. Eternity comes. The millennial kingdom is over. The eternal kingdom comes. Verse 28. And when all things shall be subdued under him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under his feet. Why? That God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, it'll be eternity. Maybe all in all. Man, that's some heavy stuff, ain't it? Yeah, it I did not read a commentary or listen to any other preacher that God. And listen, and I'm not either. I'm seeing, seeing that on you too. But listen, man, wouldn't that you need to read verse 27, 28? Think about when the kingdom is all in, when the millennial kingdom is over, and all of us go into eternity. I thought about this on the way to church this morning. I wonder if Jesus. This is how goofy I get sometimes. I can't believe me by myself, baby. I wonder if Jesus will have 10,000 years just to talk to me. Why, well, sure he will. we got eternity. I don't know when I'll be in line. Maybe I'll be down on the earth working or something because it says, you know, there's been new heaven, new earth. But sooner or later, I'll spend twenty or 40,000 years with him. So I've already been green. I have took up my ten and no more. We'll have all eternity to worship our king, won't we? Amen. I can't wait. Amen. I can't hardly wait to go there to be with him. Throughout all eternity. Oh, I know we got the preceding events. We got the rapture. Hallelujah. I look forward to that. Seeing the dead raised. Being part of all that stuff. The kingdom of God on earth. But then, Sister Cheryl, eternity comes. Man alive. All because our Savior raised from the dead. Okay, I, I had a few more verses, but we're going to we'll stop right there. We'll pick up the Lord's will in verse 29. I hope it's not. The Lord's will will pick up verse 29 in a few weeks. Let's go to the last slide here, though. Am I on the last one now, Deb? No. One more? Okay, all right. Now. Okay. Guys, here is a conclusion for this morning. Jesus is alive. You will raise from the dead someday, too. Witness to others. Please be that witness. Verse 11 said you've already believed, so be a witness to that. You're saved, saved. Live hopeful. We're not hopeless. We live hopeful. Live with this guarantee that the first fruits of Jesus has paid the price and God accepted. Let's stand together. Now that's just Carlos she's going to come to the piano. We're going to sing just let's just sing two verses of invitation. I sing the first two. And then uh, after that we're going to have to have for the elders and have a healing service and have some anoint with oil this morning, Sister Cheryl, and then any others that want to be anointed this morning. Trusting in God for His healing. Well, let's stand together as we sing this morning. Page 338. As a church is singing, you say, you know, I'm a church member, but I've never asked Jesus into my heart. What a day for you to give your life to Jesus Christ. Today you can be saved. Today you can be saved. Yes, in me. Yes, in me.
church is singing. Today is your opportunity to give your heart to Jesus. Even when we finish the invitation, when you're listening to this later, listening now, and you need Jesus Christ as Savior, ask Him into your heart. Ask Him into your heart. Praise His holy name. Praise His name. I'm going to ask the deacons if they were to come forth this